Let's pray. God, we come to your word acknowledging our need. We need to think your thoughts after you. After a week of distractions, we love to sit and listen to what you have to say together as a body of believers. We need you by the power of your Holy Spirit to use your word in our lives to accomplish your purposes, to cause us to grow, to grow in our love and our affections for you, to grow in our estimation of eternal realities, to grow in our effectiveness as ambassadors for you in this broken and cursed world, to grow in our joy and our delight in your presence. God, we ask for all these things by your help. Speak to us through your word in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Last week, as we studied the book of Ecclesiastes, we came to the end of chapter 6 and this question that Solomon poses for who knows what is good for a man during his lifetime, during the few years of his feudal life? Who knows what is good? And it sounds like a rhetorical question, like nobody knows. But Solomon doesn't leave us there. In fact, in the very next verse, in chapter 7, And on through 14 verses, the text we'll be looking at this morning, Solomon answers the question. Who is it that knows what is good for a man during his fleeting years on this earth? God does. And the way God answers is not perhaps the way you and I would answer the question. If, If I asked you, what's good for you? You might answer the question, what do I like? But that's not the question being asked. And you know there's a difference between what you like and what's good for you. I came face to face with this reality as a, as a boy. I had a heart condition that required that I take heavy antibiotics every time I went to the dentist. And I had a hard time swallowing those big penicillin horse pills. Couldn't get them down. And they were chalky. And they would stick. And they just wouldn't go down. And so I would chew them up. If you've ever had penicillin, it's the worst tasting thing I could possibly imagine. Something like, well, I won't say. It tasted like a skunk smells, we'll say it that way. And I suffered through eating this penicillin. Because I was told if any blood from my teeth went down around my heart that I would just die on the spot. So the fear of the doctor was placed in me, and I had incentive to eat the penicillin. Never mind that I played ice hockey as a kid and had teeth go through my lips multiple times, and nobody ever gave me penicillin before a hockey game. But I was told, it's good for you. I didn't like it. What we're going to look at this morning is a list of things that God says are good for us in this fleeting life. Maybe not things we would choose but things that God says are good. Let's read together Ecclesiastes chapter 7, the first 14 verses. A good name is better than a good ointment, and the day of one's death is better than the day of one's birth. It is better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting, because that is the end of every man, and the living takes it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, For when a face is sad, a heart may be happy. The mind of the wise is in the house of mourning, while the mind of fools is in the house of pleasure. It is better to listen to the rebuke of a wise man than for one to listen to the song of fools. For as the crackling of thorn bushes under a pot, so is the laughter of the fool. And this too is futility. For oppression makes a wise man mad, and a bribe corrupts the heart. The end of a matter is better than its beginning. Patience of spirit is better than haughtiness of spirit. Do not be eager in your heart to be angry, for anger resides in the bosom of fools. Do not say, why is it that the former days were better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask this. Wisdom, along with an inheritance, is good and an advantage to those who see the sun. For wisdom is protection just as money is protection. But the advantage of knowledge is is that wisdom preserves the lives of its possessors. Consider the work of God. 
For who is able to straighten what he has bent? In the day of prosperity, be happy. And in the day of adversity, consider God has made the one as well as the other so that man will not discover anything that will be after him. What's good for you in this broken world? God answers that question, and I'll summarize it with two words, sobriety and patience. Sobriety and patience. You and I live in a sinful, broken, God-cursed world. And what do we need to get along in this life if we are to have a heart of wisdom? Simply sobriety and patience. Solomon enjoins us to think about these two things with a series of better than statements. Something is better than this. And it kind of sounds like a would you rather question. I don't know if you ask those. Uh, Our family loves to ask people would you rather questions. And sometimes we'll go around the dinner table and, and ask a question, would you rather this or that? I like to ask the question, especially with men and women in the audience, uh, if you were shut in a phone booth, would you rather be shut in a phone booth with a wasp or a cockroach? Think about that for a moment. Husbands and wives are dividing mostly along gender lines. The guys, I'd much rather sit around with a cockroach. And the women are like, ooh, cockroaches, I'll take the wasp. (laughs) I don't know, maybe that's not how you thought about it. Madeline, my five-year-old, tends to not understand the point of the would-you-rather question. Here's, here's one bad situation and another bad situation. Which one would you pick? Here's her question. It sounds something like this. Would you rather be eaten alive by a great white shark or have a bowl of homemade ice cream? The Solomon's comparisons here in Ecclesiastes 7 are not a, a would-you-rather question of one thing better than the other or, or, or one thing worse than another, like uh, which would you rather have? What would you prefer? What would you like? I- instead, these are declarations of what is good for us over and against experiences we might rather enjoy. If I said, would you rather go to a birthday party or a funeral, you would pick a birthday party. And God says, it's better to go to a funeral. The first thing that we need in this broken world is sobriety. Sobriety, and a sobriety centering around our mortality. Solomon outlines this in the first six verses. Uh, Point one of our outline, or point A, is sobriety is good for you because God is sovereign. Sobriety is good for you because God is sovereign, and he's going to give us five instructions for cultivating sobriety in a broken world. He's going to instruct us through a series of carefully crafted, proverbial, better than statements. And before we jump into these five instructions, I want us to see the connection to the sovereignty of God at the end of this section that Solomon is driving us towards. Sobriety is good for you because of verses 13 and 14, where Solomon stops the discussion and says, consider the work of God. And here he has us lift our gaze. For who is able to straighten what God has bent? In the day of prosperity, be happy. In the day of adversity, consider God has made one as well as the other. Man can't discover these things. The point that Solomon is driving at is that God, the creator, the sustainer of all things, is orchestrating time and space and history and every single one of our lives meticulously to his one glorious, perfect, inexorable, immutable, good end. And lest we take up an arm wrestling match against our maker, (laughs) there is a wise posture we must take in this life and it begins with sobriety. Sobriety. The first element, the first instruction that Solomon gives us to engender sobriety for us is this. Your death day is better than your birthday, verse 1. He says, a good name is better than a good ointment, and the day of one's death is better than the day of one's birth. And I think this verse, this proverbial statement should be read as an analogy. It should be something like this. Just as a good name is better than a good ointment... Your death day is better than your birthday. The first half of the statement is obvious. The second half of the statement is shocking. To get us to the shocking statement, he's going to give us an analogy. 
The analogy is the first part of the verse, a good name is better than a good ointment. In other words, it doesn't matter how great your perfume is. If your character stinks, people don't want to be around you, right? Much better to have great character than just to cover up really stinky character with some nice smelling perfume, right? That's the picture. And just as much as that obvious statement is true, this shocking statement is also true. The day of one's death is better than the day of one's birth. In what sense can this be true? I mean, the day you were born was a, a day full of hope and expectation and, and the future and possibilities. You, you come in with arms wide open. What, the world is ready for me. What, what's going to happen? And the day of one's death is a day of endings, unspeakable sorrow, possibilities over pain and loss. What does Solomon intend here? He, he just sobered us all in even mentioning death and then ascri ascribing a better than statement to the day that you die over and against the day that you were born. Uh, this is counterintuitive. We, we try everything we can to avoid death. We try everything we can to avoid the mention of death or any prolonged thinking about death. We've sanitized our lives to remove thoughts of death from our daily existence. Solomon wants us to think about it, even thinking about it better. He's going to tell us the reason why it's better to contemplate these things in a few verses. For now, I just want us to know as believers, you and I can mean this statement far better than Solomon did. We can take these words and, and sort of get past Solomon's intention. <laughs> if we can hijack these words and, and maybe run to Philippians 1.21 and say something like Paul did, to die is gain. What has Christ done for believers but to completely transform what death is, this enemy, this thing that is just not right. This darkness, this separation of inner man from outer man, the disintegration of who you are. And Jesus Christ, by his death and his resurrection, has fundamentally transformed what death is for those who are in him. So that Jesus, while hanging on a cross, himself expiring unto death, could say to a dying man next to him, today you will be with me in paradise. And what happens then? This awful, dark, evil, tragic experience becomes a doorway, a pathway into the greatest infinite delights for those who are his. Paul said to be absent from the body and present with the Lord is better by far. That is why for you and I who are in Christ, we do not grieve as the world grieves when someone who loves the Lord goes home. We don't want them to come back to the world that Solomon himself is lamenting. Solomon, in his driving us to despair of an under-the-sun perspective, <laughs> wants us to be weary of life under the sun, under the curse, with all of its trouble and turmoil and oppression and grief and pain. For the believer, to leave from here is to enter unending joy in the presence of our Savior. Solomon says in verse 2, a second instruction that Funerals are better than parties. He says it is better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting. And house of mourning in the ancient Near East is a reference to the home where somebody died. They didn't have funeral parlors. They didn't take people somewhere else. The, the memorial service, as it were, took place in the family living room. And friends and family and sometimes professional mourners would gather at the home. And so a house of mourning is a reference to a, a home where someone had died. Solomon says it's better to go there than to a party, a house of feasting. 
And think about the last time you were at a birthday party or a work party or a frat party or a New Year's Eve party or a Super Bowl party. Did you contemplate eternal realities? When was the last time a, a party made you think about important things and serious matters? Funerals are better. Why? Solomon tells us in verse 2, because that is the end of every man. If there's one inevitable reality about life is that, is that it comes to an end. We all die. And to ignore that one inevitable reality and replace it with all the sham, the empty hopes of distractions and empty entertainments that try to get our minds off of that reality is a foolishness. You fill your life with a perpetual denial of the one thing that is sure to happen. <laughs> Solomon says, the living takes it to heart. Think about the last time you were at a funeral. What did you think about? No doubt you thought about the memories of a loved one. No doubt you grieved with others who were suffering loss. Maybe inside your heart you fumed at the wrongness of death. Maybe you set your hopes on life in Christ. Maybe you went from there and shared the gospel with someone who is still loving the land of the dying. Funerals make us think rightly. You're really not prepared to live until you have addressed your own mortality. And the mortality of a mass of humanity around us that is rushing headlong towards eternity without Christ. Fifteen years ago today, Tom mentioned it this morning in his prayer, the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center fell at the hands of terrorists. If you were alive and conscious, you remember that day. Many Americans lost their lives. Our nation was shaken. Everybody went to church for a few weeks. Everyone sought answers. There are people in this church who surrendered their lives to Jesus Christ and were born again as a result of that event. The living take it to heart. There's a third instruction for us to engender sobriety. Seriousness is better than silliness. Verse 3, sorrow is better than laughter. For when a face is sad, a heart may be happy. Again, this proverbial statement is counterintuitive. You say, I wanna, do you want to laugh or do you want to cry right now? Well, I want to laugh until I cry. <laughs> I don't want to be sad. Who wants to be sad? Solomon said, that's better. You must understand that Solomon also wrote that laughter makes the heart joyful. There, there's a place for laughter. God is not a cosmic killjoy. God is not against comedy. God is not against a good laugh. But in the big scheme of things, life is too serious to fill your life with frivolity. To spend all your time with silliness. To distract yourselves from the reality of what life is, how long eternity is, and what death means. There's a fourth instruction it's found in verse 4. Pondering death is better than ignoring death. Solomon says, The mind of the wise is in the house of mourning, while the mind of fools is in the house of pleasure. And here wisdom is invoked on what you choose to think about. And what Solomon said in verse 3 is, when a face is sad, a heart may be happy. It's really terrible when it's the other way around. All jokes on the outside and tragedy in the heart. You know, recently, we've had some of our favorite comedians in our culture take their own lives. They're the ones that perked us all up and, and they met their maker, tragically. The wise man ponders mortality, actually seeks out the house of mourning. Listen, I think the instruction here is, if you get invited to a funeral, you should go. And take your kids to as many funerals as you can. 
We tend to want to bury death under distraction, put it six feet under our euphemisms. You know, we say that someone passes away or they've gone to a better place. Well, not if they don't know Christ. We love to distract ourselves or entertain ourselves. And, and it's a really remarkable paradox. We live in a uh, sort of a death culture. Uh, we're entertained by violence. Uh, we, we, we play games that sort of make death prevalent in an animated way, an acted out way. And, and maybe that's some sort of cathartic reaction to the reality of our mortality that we, we sort of make fun of death or, or get it around us in a comfortable way so that we don't have to deal with its realities. Now, that's not unlike the 3,000-year-old holiday that's <laughs> perpetuated in Central America for the last 3,000 years in October and November, Dia de los Muertos. You see the people dressed up in sort of clownish skeleton costumes. And it's sort of a mockery of death to bring it into our lives to subdue its ferocity. Listen, if I can make fun of death in some way, then I'm in charge of it. Well, until you die. If the city of Tempe will allow it, and, and if our little complex of businesses here would agree to it, when I die, I want you to bury me in the parking lot with a headstone, you know, a cross. And maybe the rest of you could be buried there too so that when people park their cars, they then have to walk through the headstones to get in the front doors. Right, that's how they did it in Puritan New England. We'll probably never get back there. <laughs> HOA wouldn't be a big fan. What was the point of putting the cemetery in the front yard of the church? Walk through the reminders of death. To come in these doors and find life. Think about your mortality. The mind of fools, on the other hand, second part of verse 4, is in the house of pleasure. Avoid funerals at all costs. Avoid thinking about death. Just placate my mind. Ameliorate the pain with distractions and entertainment. There's a fifth instruction for sobriety in a broken world. A wise rebuke is better than a good time. Look how Solomon says it. It is better to listen to the rebuke of a wise man than for one to listen to the song of fools. I don't know if you woke up this morning and said, I just love being corrected. <laughs> I love it when someone has the temerity to come into my life, step into my business, and tell me that I'm wrong. <laughs> just love that. <laughs> no, we don't love that. This fails on the would you rather question, right? No, we... We'd rather listen to Top 40 radio and all those silly pop songs that tell us we should love ourselves more than we already do, right? Would you rather listen to pop or get a wise rebuke? Maybe some of you just love the pain and hate pop music so much that you would take the rebuke instead. Think about the last time you had a really hard day. What did you want to do when you were weary, exhausted, feeling the curse of work more than maybe other days. Turn on the television, just chill. Or did you want to listen to a really convicting sermon that lays open your heart, exposes your motives for what they are, and shows you your shortcomings and addresses your wrong thinking? <laughs> Which one did you pick? I, I know what I would rather do. What does God say is good for me? A rebuke from wisdom. A rebuke from wisdom. It's not what we would like. <laughs> it's what's good for us. Most of these instructions here in this first part of verse uh, of Ecclesiastes 7 revolve around a sobriety about death. And maybe this itself comes as a stinging rebuke to a life lived for the now. <laughs> And it's good for us. I have a three-sentence motto on our desktop computer at home that just shows as the screensaver. It goes like this. Life is short. Hell is real. Heaven is home. 
And that last one's true only for the believer. Life is short. Hell is real. Heaven is home. I love to laugh. I love to have fun. I love wrestling with my kids. And I want that slogan emblazoned in our living room so that we see it every day. There's a second area that we need to see this morning. For wisdom, if we are to have what is good for us, and it's patience. We need sobriety, and we need patience. This is verses 7 to 12. Patience is good for you because God is sovereign. The next several verses deal with our need to be patient under God's meticulous sovereignty over the world. He has bent the universe. Nobody can unbend it. We are to take with joy what God gives us that's delightful, and we are to take as worshipers with equal joy what God gives us as hardships. That's where this sermon is going in Solomon's mind. And so we need patience for those things. And he gives us five instructions for cultivating patience in a broken world. And again, Solomon instructs us here through some more better than statements as well as some direct commands. And the first one is this, recognize that the days are evil. He says in verse 7, for oppression makes a wise man mad and a bribe corrupts the heart. And by mad here in verse 7, he doesn't mean angry, he means crazy. The sin around us can make the wisest among us go nuts. Makes you want to rip your hair out sometimes. Why is this world so corrupt? Why can't it just work right? Look at the injustice around us. Look at the government waste. Look at the corruption. How is it possible that the abortion industry is still operating in the 21st century with ultrasounds, with everything we know about life? Didn't we learn anything from the 20th century? Didn't we learn anything from Adolf Hitler? How can these things be? And the more you contemplate the wickedness of our world and the oppression we see around us, the more you're tempted to go crazy. This is all the more reason for us to put our hope outside of this world. This demands patience. The second part of this proverb is about bribery. He said a bribe corrupts the heart. And the idea here is a a twisting of that which might otherwise have been straight, a, a perversion of that which might have been true, a corruption of that which might have been clean. Think about what a bribe is. An appeal is made to the discontentment in the human heart. A great setup for a bribe is maybe you're underpaid at work. And somebody comes along and needs a favor that you can do. And you just doing your job is going to get you a little extra under the table. So you take that bribe. And maybe you believe that you deserve more than you're getting, so a little extra actually makes it right. I want justice, and so the bribe brings about justice. Do you see what just happened? The twisting, the perversion, the corruption, the very corruption we complain about just happened to me at the heart level because of my discontentment, my impatience, my failure to trust in the sovereignty of God for His provision for my life. But we need patience. Patience doesn't give in to such things, but waits for God to get us through these evil days. We recognize the days are evil. Recognize that this isn't yet the end. Second instruction for us for patience in a broken world is to embrace the process. Verse 8. Solomon writes, The end of a matter is better than its beginning. This is a nice sounding proverbial statement. Uh, The end is better than the beginning. All's well that ends well, you know. Uh, Both football teams may boast of their assured victory before the game, but only one can boast of victory after the game. I know I'm not the only one in this room who's played racquetball with Steve Brotherton. Steve likes to give this refrain probably every time we've played. I don't know if you do that with everybody you play, but the man who puts on his armor should not boast as the man who takes his armor off. (laughs) 
Think about that for a moment. The man who takes his own armor off is not dead, right? Patience is the virtue in view here. There's a process that must unfold according to this proverbial statement. The outcome of a matter is what will stand. To prematurely boast about a situation before seeing the end is immaturity and impatience. And the flip side of this, I think, is what Solomon has in view. To prematurely complain before we see the end is immaturity and impatience. Look at the second half of verse 8. Patience of spirit or longness of spirit is better than height of spirit. Right? Patience is better than pride. Wait. Wait. I know that when I'm out of coffee and, and I roast coffee at home, the, sometimes when it's 112 degrees outside and, and I'm going to go roast coffee on my grill over an open flame for 20 minutes, turning this thing over again to the coffee, I, that's not an appealing thought. It's hot outside and I'm preparing something for a hot beverage. It's only when I have the end in sight that this becomes something of a tolerable experience. The end of the matter is better than the beginning. Uh, there, there's something that needs to be overcome in the trial to produce the end result. And for the Christian, this proverbial statement has remarkable implications. All is, in fact, well that ends well. Think about trials. This comes from the New Testament in James chapter 1. Consider it all joy, my brethren, whenever you encounter various trials. Yay, trials are fun. Trials are great. Rejoice. No, <laughs> not because of the trial itself, but because of its end result, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. I want to be mature in Christ. I want to grow in Him. I want to be more like Him. Great. Here's some trials. That's what accomplishes that goal. You ever think about that when you're in a trial, that the answer to your prayer request to grow in Christ <laughs> might be the very thing you're complaining about? Romans 5 says the same thing. We exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. Perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope, a confidence in the realities of the future in eternity. Hope doesn't disappoint. Why? Because the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts through the Holy Spirit whom He has given us. Life in a broken world, for those who are right with their maker, passes quickly into unending delight. Do you understand that very soon we will have spent more time in eternity than we have on this earth? Very soon. Listen to Romans 8. You know this. We know that God causes all things to work together for good. To those who love him and are called according to his purpose. For those whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. So that Jesus would be the firstborn, the preeminent one over many brethren. And everyone that God predestined, he also called. And everyone he called, he also declared righteous, justified. And everyone he justified, he also glorified. And Paul uses a past tense verb to describe a certain future reality. Because in God's plan, it's as good as done. All things are working to that end. And next time you experience something, you're tempted to complain about or be impatient under Remember, it's one of those all things that God is actually employing for your infinite good, believer. Of that great tapestry that God is weaving in this life, one writer has said, there will not then be found one misplaced thread nor any wrong set color in any of it. Well, we don't see how it all fits together here. But God is not erred in any of those things He's brought into our life. Verse 9 gives us a third instruction. Be slow to anger. He says, do not be eager in your heart to be angry, for anger resides in the bosom of fools. Don't be eager in your heart to be angry. 
The imagery here of anger dwelling in, living in, taking up residence in the heart of the fool is that idea that anger is a characterization of who you are. It just sort of sits there. It lives in your house, makes its home there. That's a fool. A wise man is not eager to be angry. Ephesians 4.26 tells us something similar. Be angry and do not sin. In other words, it's conceivable to be angry and to not sin. God himself does that. And yet most often that emotion in us is contaminated with pride, with selfishness, with inconsistency, with hypocrisy, with foolishness and short-sightedness. Oh, no doubt there are things to be angry at in this world. And yet I, I fear our anger. It's so often a mark of impatience a mark of prayerlessness, a a mark of wanting to do God's business my way, an inability to rest in the sovereignty of God. Think about the things you tend to get angry about. (laughs) I think you'll find that most of those are in the category of what God himself has brought into your life. So to be angry about my present circumstance is in fact to lay an angry fist or an angry charge against God's account in the way he is governing the universe. And when in our best days, in our purest forms, our anger is lodged against evil, (laughs) have you found the venom, (laughs) the vitriol of your anger to take aim at the evil in your own heart as well? Be slow to anger. There's a fourth instruction for patience in a broken world. It is to find contentment in the present. Solomon says, don't say, why is it that the former days were better than these? Right? Solomon says, don't hearken back to the good old days. Remember the good old days? Back when we were great. And, and we use selective memory when we think about the good old days. Right? If, if you're trying to tell youngsters how great they have it, you think about the good old days this way. I had to walk, trudge through the snow, waist deep uphill, both ways, in the dark. You got it easy, kid. Back in my day, you know, we do that. And then we flip it around and we say, ah, it was so great back in my day. Boy, these times are terrible. (laughs) You know, I've had the habit of quoting 20th century musical poetry in this series in Ecclesiastes. I'm going to quote something a little more current. Wish we could turn back time to the good old days when the mamas sang us to sleep, but now we're stressed out. Some of you got that reference. Some of you curmudgeons, I mean you musical sophisticates, are saying, man, remember the good old days when they made real music? We forget the evils of the past. We fondly remember the best things. And we wish for a return to the good old days. Really, this is a charge against God's sovereign orchestration of all things and the end to which he is driving time, space, and history. You know what Paul says in Romans? Today we are one day closer to our salvation. (laughs) Why would we want to turn back the clock? Let's go home. Solomon says, it is not from wisdom that this is said. Besides, a a better contemplation than how bad our times are would be, how bad is my heart? The the residual sinfulness that still plagues me, when can I be free? (laughs) When do I get to go home? There's another instruction in verses 11 and 12, and it is protect yourself with wisdom. Solomon says, wisdom along with an inheritance is good. And it's an advantage to those who see the sun. For wisdom is protection just as money is protection. And the advantage of knowledge is that wisdom preserves the lives of its possessors. You think, well, Solomon, I really don't understand the book of Ecclesiastes. You've told us that wisdom is great, then it doesn't mean anything because we all die. Now you're telling me it's advantageous again. Which is it? Yes, it's all of the above. (laughs) The wise and the fool both die. Wisdom has advantages that Solomon portrays here. And he compares it to money. And you would think, yeah, Solomon, what is it? Is money good? Is money bad? (laughs) Here he says money has its advantages. Money can protect. 
Just as money can protect you from unforeseen circumstances, medical emergencies, the loss of a job, so also, and this is Solomon's point, wisdom serves as a protection for you in a cursed and broken world. You want to know how to navigate life in a broken world? Employ wisdom. Just like you plan ahead financially to hedge against the unpredictabilities of life, so you ought to plan ahead to get the kind of wisdom, the God-fearing wisdom that will help you navigate this life. And in this context, I think Solomon has in mind, first and foremost, the kind of wisdom that is exhibited in patiently waiting on God, trusting His meticulous sovereignty, trusting His glorious and inevitable, inexorable victory, trusting His immutable promises, trusting the unstoppable love that He has for all who are His. Sobriety and patience are good for you. According to Ecclesiastes 7, they are good for you because God is sovereign. And if you know what's good for you, you will entrust yourself to God. This brings us to this summation point that Solomon gives in verses 13 and 14. The sovereignty of God. Look, verse 13. God bent the world. Consider his work, Solomon says. For who is able to straighten what God has bent? This is what Paul says in Romans 8.20. The creation was subjected to futility. Not willingly, but because of God who subjected it. Why did God bend the created order? Why did he tweak the universe so that when men try to get satisfaction out of the good things that God gives, those blessings aren't readily available? Why is it that all of the creation that God said was originally good, why can it not yield what it was supposed to? Why are there thorns and thistles? Why is there death? Why the frustration? Why the futility? And why can't anybody do anything about it? And the answer to that is sin. Sin. Let's go back to those moments when God bent the universe. And you can turn to Genesis chapter 2. In Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. God has created man, the man, Adam. He's in the garden. And God has said, I've given you all this. <laughs> Eat. Cultivate the garden. Think about that. Work was fun back then. <laughs> Food was delightful with no adverse side effects. Eat it all. It's all for you. Fellowship with God was unbroken. Marriage was sweet and perfect. Every human relationship was without discord. <laughs> and God told the man this, from any tree of the garden, you may eat freely, Genesis 2.16. But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you shall surely die, or dying you will die. What did Adam and his wife do? The one thing God prohibited. Rejecting the freedom, the joy, the life that was available to them. They made a path for themselves. In effect, they decided to be God rather than worship God. To have life on their own terms. To believe a talking snake. And in Genesis 3, beginning in verse 8, we read this account. Adam and Eve heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And then the Lord God called to the man and said, Where are you? Not because God didn't know. <laughs> but he's interacting with the man in relationship. And Adam replied, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked so I hid myself. And God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And the man blame shifted. The woman whom you gave me, Adam, blames Eve and blames God. 
She gave me from the tree and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The snake deceived me and I ate. And so God said to that serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle, more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, dust you will eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. We find out as the pages of Scripture unfold, this, this is no one else but Satan, who is God's arch enemy, who rejected God and is now out to murder the human race from its very inception. And mankind is responsible and will suffer the consequences for their sin. And yet God lays down a curse first on Satan. Enmity between Satan and the woman, between his seed and her seed. And that woman's seed, that woman's offspring will crush him one day. Of course, that's good news for humanity, now rocked by death. That one day there is hope. Verse 16, the curse, the bending of the woman's universe takes place. God says, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you will bring forth children. Yet your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. The realm in which the woman lived and operated was now cursed by God and blessed. <laughs> right? The, the woman could have said, if this is what this is all about, if I'm going to have pain in childbirth, forget Adam. <laughs> And yet, God blessed the human race by saying her desire will still be for her husband. And the curse on the man, the continued tweaking of the universe in verse 17 to Adam, he said, because you've listened to the voice of your wife, you've eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat. Cursed is the ground because of you. That's interesting. The whole world, the, the earth itself, the, the created order feels the effects, the consequences of the fall of Adam and Eve. Because of Adam's sin, the ground gets cursed. In toil you will eat of the ground all the days of your life. Um, before you were in the garden, you cultivated, I provided all this food for you. Enjoy. Now. By the sweat of your face, you will eke bread out of the ground, says God. And you'll return to the dust, for from it you came, to it you will return. Uh, the very word Adam, Adam, man, is a derivative of the, of the word for dirt. Adam, you are dirt. You came from the dirt. You're going back to the dirt. From the dirt, you will eke out an existence, a cursed existence. From the very first pages of our history, death enters. In fact, Genesis chapter 5 is the condensed biography of mankind under the pall of death and the curse of God. Romans 5 describes it this way, just as sin entered the world through one man, death entered through sin, and so death spread to all men, and as a result of death spreading to all men, all men sin. Sin was the cause of death spreading. The spread of death is now the contamination of sin in all of us. That is why God bent the world. Because he wasn't going to allow his image bearers to remain on his perfect Garden of Eden earth and have access to him and fellowship with him in a state of sinful rebellion. And so the curse on the world is, in one part, a consequence of our rebellion. In another part, it is a redirection of our attentions so that we don't think that our hope lies here, so that we don't think the answers are here, under the sun, in this broken world, or in us, the rebels. We don't have the answers. We don't have the solutions. No one can unbend what God has bent but God can, and He will. And He promises a new heavens and a new earth for all who are His, 
For all who were purchased by the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, who himself came to the earth, lived under the curse, lived in the broken world, experienced our brokenness, felt the pain of death, endured the very wrath of God, the eternal death as a consequence for sin, in order to pay for the sins, past, present, and future, of everyone who would ever believe, everyone who would ever surrender to him, everyone who had cast their life on him, so that we could have hope and life. God would not allow us to remain in a godless state. But we, a humanity with eternity in our hearts, chafe against this broken world. It is a daily reminder that we were made for something transcendent. We were made for something infinitely bigger. We were made for Him. And nothing will be right until you are right with Him. Even joy in this life is available to you if you know him who is the source of joy. That is one of the themes of Solomon's sermon in Ecclesiastes. Verse 14 of chapter 7 gives us a sort of practical response to the sobriety and patience needed for understanding the sovereignty of God in a broken and cursed world. Here's a response. In the day of prosperity, Solomon says, be happy. But in the day of adversity, consider, God has made the one as well as the other. That's right. That's what Job said when he lost everything that he had. And talking to his wife, he said, shall we accept good things from God and not the adversities? He, he brings them both. God is sovereign God is the one driving history. He knows where it's going. He's taking it to a perfect, good, and glorious end for all who belong to him. We can trust him in the meantime. How do you view your daily walk in a broken world, in a God-cursed world? Are you thinking about death every day? I hope so. It's a nice, happy message. It's a necessary one. It's good for us. Are you wisely pursuing patience? It's not what I would rather do. Ian Wrightout was one of my roommates in college, and he sang this little ditty, have patience, have patience, don't be in such a hurry. Dun, 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 dun. It was so irritating. <laughs> and he would always whip that song out whenever somebody in the house was a little frustrated. It never had the effect that Ian intended. I th maybe it did. I th maybe it was a provocation. There is a patience available by the power of God through the Holy Spirit. It's actually fruit of what he produces in a heart. And a great measure of the patience that the Holy Spirit produces in the heart of a believer is an ability to wait on God in a broken and cursed world for the day when he wraps it all up, when he wins, and all who are his get to enjoy his presence in ever-increasing delight for all eternity. We long for that day. Oh God, we come to you this morning and we pray that last prayer of the Bible. Lord Jesus, come quickly. We know that our citizenship is in heaven, that our home is a place we've never yet been, and yet you've secured for everyone who knows you a, a home where there is no more sorrow, no more sin, no more sadness. Every tear is wiped away. No more crying, no more pain, where the former things are gone, where there is no more curse. The best of all, where you are, our heart's treasure and our delight. It is by the power of your own Son who came and tasted death for us and then conquered death. The one who said, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord. I take it up again. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. 
And Lord Jesus, it is you who by your resurrection secure for all of us who know you resurrection as well. We praise you for it in your name.